from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for January 14th, 2022. The Packers have a bye week and are home resting up for the playoffs. But your Milwaukee Bucks are in action with the Toronto Raptors Saturday at the Forum. Under new COVID restrictions, you must show your vaccine passport to buy booze and pot in Quebec, Canada. To no surprise, the vaccination rate has quadrupled. <laughs> it's a bizarre fact. Hamsters have the highest alcohol tolerance in the animal kingdom. So how do you measure that? Well, scientists give those little fur balls the equivalent of a liter and a half of Everclear daily. Everclear is 190 proof pure grain alcohol, and the hamsters, given the choice between water and Everclear, opt for the Everclear every time. <laughs> Hi, my name is Campster the Hamster, and this is my first Hamsters Anonymous meeting. <laughs> a supermarket chain in the UK is doing away with expiration dates. They're asking customers to sniff the food. If it's okay with you, it's okay with us. <laughs> really? <laughs> Thanks to the broken supply chain, Japan has a major shortage of potatoes. And you know what that means? No French fries, no potato chips, and now there's no good reason to go to Japan. It's good to be a dictator, or so I've been told. The former Supreme Leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-il, and the father of the current Supreme Leader, Kim Jong-un, is being credited with inventing burritos. I'm glad they straightened that out. All this time I thought he invented the chalupa. <laughs> and finally, in this red hot real estate market, a couple of Maryland, a couple of folks in Maryland thought they got a bargain on a three bedroom house. They paid $70,000 below asking price. And of course there was a catch. The house was the scene of a real life demonic possession that inspired the film, The Exorcist. But saving $70,000, That'll make your head spin. <laughs> <laughs> On the podcast today, we have Kyle Tedding, Art Rothschild, Mike Helsel, Joel Driesing, and wrapping up the week, here's Bob Landis. Thanks, Max. Pretty ugly week. Monday, the Dow dropped 162 points. Tuesday, up 183, snapping a five-day losing streak. Made a few nickels on Wednesday, up 38 points, down 176 on Thursday, dropping 202 points today to close out the week. NASDAQ down three-tenths of a percent this week, losing 42 points, closed at 14,894. The broader markets, S&P dropped three-tenths of a percent as well, losing 14 points, closing at 46.63. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average shed 320 points, losing nine-tenths of a percent. Closed at the bell this afternoon in New York with the Dow finishing the week 35,911. Year to date, NASDAQ really bore the brunt of the selling, mostly last week. NASDAQ down now 4.8% for the first two weeks of the year. SP down 2.1% for the first two weeks. And the Dow down 1.1%. You know, Kyle seems to me that the market is adjusting to the reality that higher rates are coming. You know, one reason for the drop in stocks, of course, was the release of the minutes last week from the Fed, which showed growing unease about inflation, perhaps accelerating the pace of rate increases. You know, the future markets as recently as early December, forecasting two, maybe three rate increases for the year. Now, looks like the market's gearing up for three, maybe even four rate increases. And as we all know, it's about earnings and interest rates. Interest rates go up. Stocks tend to be volatile. Uh, I think there's potentially good news on the inflation front, which we'll get to in a minute. But Kyle, this seems to me like a, just a standard readjustment in the face of higher rates. Yeah, of course. Let's remember that we finished the year with Ford PEs nearing 22. And so you know, I think as we we talk about the kinds of things that we were expecting coming into 2022, I think some sensitivity to the Fed, some sensitivity to interest rates was certainly something that was top of mind. 
I think it's obvious when you look at what has sold off so far this year, when you look at the challenges that we've seen in some of the high flying or high octane growth stocks, you know, that this is very much a response to, you know, some, some fed moves, some fed conversation. Um, and in addition to that, I think, you know, we, we have talked for a while about how, you know, there's support from earnings, there's support from lower interest rates, but it takes a little while to, di- to digest some of these changes. And so I think, you know, I'm comfortable with, uh, you know, a little give back given how strong the end of the year was last year. I think, you know, the, the volatility itself isn't done, but we're also getting into the middle of earnings season now. And so, um, you know, as you mentioned, it is all about earnings and interest rates. The interest rate piece has been a little more challenging, uh, but starting to get a little more information on earnings so we get a better idea of what to expect for the rest of the year. You know, when you look at forward earnings, forward PE now on the S&P down to 20.7, but I find it so interesting that Energy stocks, for example, are at 12 times forward earnings. There's a bargain. Financials, although they got hammered today, 15 times forward earnings. So, uh, you know, you take a look at the tech stocks by comparison, and they're at a whopping 27 times forward earnings. Kyle, I think it's important to remind investors uh, that when interest rates go up, it adversely affects the growth stocks maybe even some of the tech stocks in particular. Sounds complicated, folks. This is pretty easy to explain. If you try to value a company, you try to look into the future as far as possible to get a handle on what their future cash flow is going to look like. Then you got to discount that by usually the yield on the 10-year treasury to come up with present value. And the point simply is companies like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, Netflix, Facebook that are gushing cash get discounted uh, more uh, because interest rates have gone up than the companies that have modest to moderate cash flow. Um, So we've seen that since late fall where the tech stocks in particular uh, were lagging behind the broader markets. Um, I think the only thing that'll change that is when rates peak out, hopefully later this spring, maybe sometime this summer. And I think we we start to look at an environment in which quality of earnings matters as much as the growth of earnings, right? And so, um, you know, as interest rates rise, as earnings growth becomes less of an important factor in kind of what we're willing to pay today, the consistency and quality of those earnings, right? How much can we trust that this company is going to deliver? I think that becomes a more important piece of the conversation. We've seen it already this year with how well the Dow has held up relative to the NASDAQ. You know, the Dow tends to be businesses, I think, that are a little more established, a little uh, cleaner path toward their earnings growth. It may not be as robust uh, of a rate of growth, but again, I think you can trust that, you know, if they think they're going to get 6 or 7%, they're going to get 6 or 7%. Joel, let's bring you into the show. The headline for the week, of course, was the inflation numbers that came out. Um, they were certainly jaw-dropping. A lot of pros think, though, that this is the peak in the cycle for inflation. Yeah, Bob, it's interesting because I find myself um, sort of reading the headlines and reading the stories, and um, a lot of things get hyped up, and I'm actually seeing things that are more, uh, you know, finding rays of hope in that. So so, um, the Consumer Price Index, which is the broadest measure of, of inflation, that went up 7%. Um, from December of 2020 to, to December of 2021, that's the biggest increase since 1982, and that is jaw dropping. But part of that is a 50% increase in gasoline prices. Um, it's a 37% increase in used cars. Um, so there are these one offs in there that um, that suggest to me maybe that you know maybe um, this isn't uh, going to be a long lasting thing. You have those one offs that suggests that you know maybe there's some hope there. We also had the producer price index, which a lot of times is a, is a precursor to the consumer price index. And that had the smallest month to month increase in December um, in, in 13 months. So, um, and even in December, that 7% year to year, it was a 5%, in, uh, I'm sorry, a 0.5% increase from November. And that was the smallest in three months. So there are some signs out there that you know, we don't know for sure, but you know, maybe inflation's not going to be around that long. 
Arthur, let's bring you into the show. You know, the Warren expression, as January goes, so goes the year. Let's hope this year is the exception to that cliche. <laughs> well, I, it, it, let's hope it is. I agree with you on that. But how, how short our memories are, um, our memory span. A, a week ago, um, I've got the headline from the Wall Street Journal, Dow S&P start year by hitting records. That was a Tuesday's edition of the Wall Street Journal. So a week ago, it was happy days are here again. Um, now we're getting into the reality of the fact that markets don't go up in a straight line. We have to overcome obstacles. And again, this week, the obstacle is, as Joel just pointed out, higher inflation. Um, I do think inflation is the big subject for the year. I think it will continue to be with the higher interest rates that the Fed has promised they're going to come when they're done with their tapering. And, and of course, they're also talking about starting to unload um, the, some of the nine and a half trillion, I believe, that they have uh, on the books. So I'm going to caution our listeners not to react to the headlines. Don't react to the daily and weekly trading. The NASDAQ, as you indicated, getting hit because of higher interest rates. And you have to discount the, if you want to call it values of those companies, using higher interest rates makes a lot of sense to me. The fact that the Dow actually started off better this year, just like it did last year. And the fact that, as you indicated, there are values in the value stocks. I'm, gonna, I'm going to expect that trend to continue for the year. Um, and I'm expecting this to be a good year, um, regardless of what happens throughout the month, with the one impediment being concerns about inflation. And, and again, the, the way I think that's going to get resolved, um, I do think we should expect the demand from workers for higher wages. And I expect those wages you know, to go up. And then I expect companies to raise prices in response to the uh, higher wages. So I do expect to see continuing inflation although producer prices or the increases in producer prices may have peaked. I don't think the price increases have peaked, um, but I think stocks are going to overcome that. I think we're going to have a good year in the market. But when you look back at the past three years, which have been just absolutely spectacular, um, I, I don't th think we should expect a repeat of the past three years, but single digit decent returns on the, uh, on the S and P and the Dow and the NASDAQ even, I think for the rest of the year, and I think we have to really watch duration as we continue to do at the firm, um, because my expectation is that interest rates, as you suggested, will continue to go higher. It's interesting to note, after reviewing literally dozens of forecasts for this year, that the consensus seems to be now that inflation is going to peak this quarter and then head lower uh, towards the Fed targets by the end of the year, meaning that inflation could be in the two and a half percent to three percent range by year end. A little bit reassuring to see that Wednesday when the inflation report came out, markets actually went up. Uh, but rising rates always create volatility for the markets. You know, a month ago on the podcast, I was talking about the fall of 2018. Stocks lost 19 percent. Nobody remembers that anymore because stocks made 32 percent the year after, uh, and the Fed even admitted that they raised rates too high. Uh, so uh, rates started going down, of course, late in January of 2019, and, and the markets took off. But you know, for all the years that I've been at this, when I look at the likelihood of probably three rate increases this year. Boy, that's nothing compared to what I've been used to. Uh, you know, Greenspan raised rates seven times in 94. Nobody saw it coming. Markets got hammered. Um, so I don't mean to be light about the inflation, but, you know, Joel pointed out that a lot of the increases energy, a lot of the increases uh, disruptions in the supply chain, that they think that they're going to be unwound by later in the year. Um, Mike, let's bring you into the program here. Um, you know, what's your take on the year and, and how do you see things as a money manager? Uh, well, I really, I want to piggyback off uh, something you and Joel said, basically about the energy sector, kind of looking at some data today, because it's funny how this year kind of started off like last year in terms of value, really outperforming growth in a pretty significant way. Um, and you look into that, and it's really driven by the energy sector, which uh, right now, I think you mentioned a little bit, Bob, is up over 14% year to date and was up 48% last year. Um, 
And that's really driven by the crude oil prices, which are up 23% since December, which is a three-year high. Um, and they're saying the S&P 500 energy companies, uh, just want to get this number right because it was pretty big, uh, are expected to increase by re uh, revenue by 72% in the fourth quarter is what they're kind of projecting. So I think going forward, at least in the short term, for sure, you're going to see value to continue to outperform growth because of what you're saying is rising, rising, st um, sorry, rising rates uh, in the treasuries. But also, if energy continues to drive value like that, I think you're going to see a pretty significant outperformance value compared to uh, growth stocks. Thank you for that, Kyle. Let's switch gears here and talk econ 101 for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, we experienced in March and April of 2020 one of the largest economic contractions in modern history. Um, but then it following produced one of the fastest recoveries in history. So business cycles, you know, normally last five, six years, give or take, right? So much of the global economy is transitioned quickly from an early cycle recovery, um, you know, to a mid cycle expansion. And it's not something you typically see in, in less than two years uh, from the contraction. So the point is, uh, you know, investors are really being forced uh, to change their thinking relative to the timing. We're not in the early stage of an expansion. Uh, you know, we're mid-cycle heading to late stage. And, you know, my main point in saying this is the markets are almost inevitably volatile when the Fed's raising rates. We're just going to have to gut out higher inflation for this quarter, maybe even into the second quarter. But I think in the second half of the year, people are going to get a really pleasant surprise, hopefully, that the inflation numbers are going to come down. The Fed's going to be happy with their rate increases. We get back to focusing on earnings, and then things will look pretty good. You know, I think the, the challenge that investors face is as we transition from kind of mid-cycle into late cycle, it doesn't mean that growth disappears. It means that growth tends to slow a little bit. It tends to uh, stagnate a little bit, but, but that can persist for a while. And I think especially this cycle, given how quickly we transitioned from uh, what was the, the quickest recession we've ever seen back to uh, you know, quite sizable rates of growth for the economy. I think the the reality is that the late cycle may just be able to last a little bit longer. Uh, we we may have a little more uh, room to run, but it's going to come more slowly than it did. It feels even more slow. It feels even more deliberate when you consider how quick we recovered. You know, come June, July, August of 2020, and then really across most of last year. Um, you know, I think. That's the rate of growth that's abnormal, that kind of growth uh, you don't count on long term. You need it to dig yourself back out of the hole, uh, but it gets more difficult now to continue to grow at that pace. And so I think if anything, I'm, I'm encouraged by signs that growth seems to be reaching a more sustainable rate, uh, not quite as, as significant as it had been, but certainly a rate that we should be able to persist at for a while. And so for investors, I think that means Maybe the easy money's over, right? That uh, that those high rates of growth carry just about every stock out there, because uh, even the stuff that's a bit suspect, uh, you know, they can raise their prices, they can uh, attract more more consumption of their goods or services. Um, but now we got to be a little bit more cognizant of what it is we're buying. We got to be a little bit more careful. I think it sets up nicely for active management. It sets up ni nicely for the types of investors that are focused first and foremost on risk. Because the days of just pure beta or pure volatility exposure driving portfolio returns are coming to an end. Kyle, I think that there are a number of investors out there that um, could be surprised that they are a little overweight in growth stocks. I mean, if for no other reason, the performance of growth stocks the last three years. And the risk, I think, is that rates go up higher than we think adversely impacting the growth stocks. The growth stocks tend to go down more than the rest of the market. And, you know, I completely agree with you. It's not an in or out conversation here. 
Uh, I like growth stocks long term. I like stocks period long term. Uh, but I think it's important to make sure that you're not overweight growth at a time when interest rates are going up. You know, I think it's important to remind investors that usually the first Fed rate increase, the market acts positively. Oh, you folks are finally doing something about inflation. But by the third or fourth rate increase, the attitude shifts towards, oh, you folks must be really worried about inflation. You keep raising rates. So it's not necessarily the first or even the second rate increase that can spook stocks. It's, um, you know, where is the end? Markets hate uncertainty. If we knew for sure how many rate increases we get this year, be a whole different story. Uh, but of course, uh, they've got to wait for the inflation numbers to come down. The Fed absolutely stepped up to the plate, as we saw by the release of the minutes last week, that they're prepared to fight inflation if they have to. Uh, my best guess is we get three rate increases and we get past it. Well, folks, that's the end of yet another Money Talk. We enjoyed doing the program. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com. <laughs>